And good afternoon to our social event, which is focusing on a forthcoming publication, everything you always wanted to know about the EU health policy and COVID-19 responses. And I think this session today could not be more timely. If you had listened yesterday to Ursula von der Leyen's State of the Union address, you would have heard her saying, last year I said it was time to build a European health union. Today we are delivering. So that is what she said yesterday. And the question, of course, is uh, what are they delivering? What does it mean? Health used to be a minor issue in European Union health policies. It was almost a negligent issue. It was uh, here and there mentioned, but the main policies were others and uh, certainly not health. And out of a sudden, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen that health has not only moved up on the political agenda, but also that very bold measures have been taken. We've seen that old institutions got new roles we have seen new institutions emerging. We have seen intensified joint procurement. And of course, a lot of talk about European Health Union. We've seen massive budget increases and also new economic governance in the European Union, just to name a few. And Figuerica, if you could please start now my presentation. The reason why we have this session here is because we are actually developing um, a little book, which is called, like this session, next slide, next, yeah, everything you always wanted to know about uh, European Union health policies, but we're afraid to ask. And um, we started with this in 2013, and uh, the last edition was in 2019. We were planning actually to have the next one in 2024, right after the European parliamentary election before the new commission, the new parliament established themselves. But because of these massive changes, we felt, no, we have need to have the third update right now, actually, to incorporate all the major changes made due to COVID-19 responses. Um, as you can see in the middle, this is a very practical book. It's used by a lot of people in the health sector, especially, of course, in Brussels or people which are dealing with EU health policies or which want to learn about EU health policies. But also inside the European Commission, as you can see, uh, this is the former um, Commissioner for Health, Vitinis Andriokaitis, and he holds up his book, you know, which he has used heavily with a lot of things um, underlined and um, we launched it last uh, in 2019 actually uh, together with him. Uh, next one please Federica. We are actually a team of eight authors and I think if you see the uh, contents of the book in a minute uh, you will understand why this is necessary to have such a big team because health you, feel, you will find health in so many policies in so many aspects of um, EU policy and uh, there's no one single author who can uh, overview all these different aspects and therefore we are very grateful that we have a quite large team. Unfortunately, due to um, family reasons, job reasons, but also religious reasons, not all of us can be here today. So uh, four colleagues, Nick Fai, Holly Jarman, Willie Palm and Sarah Rosenblum can't make it and uh, join the discussion today. But uh, luckily, we have Ellie Brooks, Scott Greer, who is the lead author of this um, volume. We have Anik de Ruta and myself, Matthias, uh, who is going to guide you through this um, session. We want to keep it as informal as possible. So we hope that a lot of questions are coming through the question and answers and um, that we can answer as many of your questions as possible. So that's about it. And I would like to hand over to Scott now, actually, but he just disappeared from the screen. Scott, will you read this? <laughs> Join us? Yes, but I am having some sort of static problem. So could one of somebody else do the screen share quickly? Yes, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
And at some point, I'm going to appear. I don't know quite why I haven't. But um, thank you, Matthias, for queuing it up. And I really want to get out of the way in large part and make an opportunity for Ellie and Anik to speak. And I'm sorry that we were unable to have some of our other authors with us. But our job is to introduce the framework of the book and why we had to do another edition so early on after publishing in 2019. And I think the reasons that motivated us to drop everything and start writing are substantially the reasons why you might want to have a look at the book. Next slide, please. So here's the treaty based slide because you're really not allowed to talk about the European Union without having some excerpts from the treaties. And here's Article 168, which is pretty much the whole public health title of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. I bolded a number of phrases. Basically, these phrases, and then if you look through the rest of the article, you find a bunch more, are all the different ways that you can say in European law that the European institutions are not in charge. They're all the different ways in which you can say that there is a permissive framework which can allow the member states to decide to do something, which can allow the European Parliament and the likes to have an opinion. But there's nothing like the sort of tough law, judicial oversight, and potential expansion of capabilities that you find on, for example, internal market law or fiscal governance. That leads to the situation that we face when we're analyzing European Union health policies, which is what are the health policies? Next slide, please. This is the framework that we came up with. It's the three phases of EU health policy. The first phase is the explicit health policies. It's what you get if you go on the European Commission website and click on public health. It's the stuff that is organized by DG Santé. It has a commissioner. It has identified budget lines. It's institutionalized and it's got its own treaty base, which is Article 168, the TFEU, plus an Article 9, which says that the EU shall take human health into account in everything. Well, to be honest, this was a pretty marginal area. And for those of you who've spent much of your working lives hearing that EU health policy doesn't matter, you had a point. Even up to 2020, after passing a directive, the directive, much of which was still not based on Article 168, it was about patient mobility, there was a whole one dossier open for proposed regulation on health technology assessment at the beginning of the pandemic which meant that a lot of the most underexploited and potentially powerful ways to affect health using European Union health treaty bases were elsewhere. They were in social policy, which is basically about workplace regulation. They were about consumer protection. If you just count the number of times that health appears in the treaties, it's not just in Article 168. But the real story, as I think every book about EU health policies in the last 20 years has drummed into us, is that market-making policies shape health. Why was there a directive on patient mobility? Not because the concerns of people who got unauthorized non-emergency care and paid for it out of pocket and then wanted reimbursement was any kind of a normative issue worth discussing or ethical challenge or, good heavens, problem for working policymakers but because that was how you introduced European Union internal market law into the conduct of the healthcare systems. And if you back out a little bit, you look at the regulation of pharmaceuticals, you look at the regulation of state aids, the application of competition law. There's a lot of areas where health systems and health outcomes have been fundamentally affected by the operation and regulation of the European Union internal market. It's almost impossible to imagine EU pharmaceuticals markets today, except in the context of regulation by the EU with the intent of establishing the most unified market possible. Now, the third phase is fiscal governance. And this really came onto the scene in 2011, when in response to the debt crisis born of the financial crisis, a lot of old and not very effective and largely obscure mechanisms to try and impose fiscal discipline on member states were reapplied with great vigor in order to create some austerity and address the gaping divisions in economic structure within the EU by essentially forcing debtor countries to act in the way creditor countries want them to act. And I spent a decade talking about this, Ellie spent a decade talking about it. 
it was always somewhat misconceived because the real problem is that within the European Union, nobody was come up with a way to address the serious economic disparities between the South and the East and the um, North and the West. But it also demanded that the European Union police the budgets of governments, police the electoral strategies of governments and police the um, and police things that aren't really within the remit of government, such as the increase in expenditure that comes when there's an economic downturn. Over time, therefore, the initial iron cage of budgetary rationality that was imposed in 2010 and 2011 and seemed set to have so much consequence both for the autonomy of health policymakers and for the actual health of populations. Um, oh, so I'm apparently screen sharing now. And for the health of populations has been replaced by, has been worn down and gradually replaced. So for example, the goals of pro productivity and economic growth were replaced with the entire sustainable development goals by the von der Leyen Commission when they arrived. And practically anything good in the world can be provided that way. I'm a little bit hazy about what's going on with the presentation here. So is there any way, Federica, that you could screen share back to you? Or is everybody else seeing Federica's? Perfect. So here's the cartoon that we commissioned for 2019. Article 168 was a gate, a sturdy and well-oiled gate, which could be opened by the member states and closed. And when closed, it wasn't going to open by accident. The only problem was the gate was in a field with no fence. So yes, you could open the gate and close it behind you. But you could also, if you wanted to get into the world of health policy, just go around it by using competition or trade law, agricultural regulation, or the European semester. So that was the state of the art in 2019. And that's why volume two, version two of this book, substantially focused on the ways you could make good health policy without actually relying on the weak Article 168. Next slide, please. That all changed in 2020 because the member states suddenly realized um, that the European Union was too integrated to not have something like a federal public health function. And that's why we found ourselves having to create a new version of the book because in response to the member states deciding that they were very serious about public health. They opened the gate all right and they haven't closed it yet. Next slide, please. And here's a picture of this formative moment, which is from May 2020, when after, in retrospect, a very short period of national egotism and bad mood and checks impounding Chinese masks bound for Italy and refusal to even start the little rescue civil protection pool that was supposed to sustain the EU, the member state governments really got their act together and realized that they couldn't go it alone. This was kind of a big moment psychologically. And while it can look obvious in retrospect, for example, there's almost no useful medical devices in Europe whose supply chain is contained within one country. It didn't have to happen so quickly and it didn't have to happen in such a big way. Next slide, please. The big change was in the first phase. And this is one slide with a lot that's gonna change the way European health policy works. The health program had been ending and getting folded into larger funds and had all the signs of a moribund agenda. The Juncker Commission basically didn't want to have a health policy and they were pretty effective at slowly getting rid of it. eu for health is vastly expanded. It's not as big as the original commission request, but it's enormously larger than what it was and larger than any realistic policy analyst would have said was likely to happen if they'd been asked in 2019 what the future of health was. We've been talking about having no health program and maybe no health DG. Instead, we have a vastly larger EU for Health program with much more ambitious goals than the old health program. There's the vaccine strategy, which is the collective procurement in which the European Union institutions negotiated on behalf of the member states. The pharmaceutical strategy is a longer term program to improve the pharmaceuticals pipeline because both supply chain and innovation have been shown to be problematic areas in this. And then there's significant expansion of European Union agencies. The ECDC is gaining resources and role, 
after having been seen to have performed well in the pandemic despite structural flaws such as reliance on janky member state data. And there's going to be a new HERA, um, probably on an agency, but that's its form, its organizational structure is still up in the air. And here is going to focus on preparedness and building resilience against future pandemics as well as prediction. And finally, there was a huge expansion and liberalization of rescue, which is the civil protection system that allows member states to work with the EU to prepare stockpiles of valuable things for future crises. Next slide, please. Now, the second phase, we initially had the quick action by the commission against all the export bans and various forms of national egotism that we saw. Something Anique picked up that might really turn out to be important is they also redefined public health in EU law, in which instead of public health being an exception which allows a member state to violate internal market law with good cause, the Commission said we should understand public health as a Europe-wide thing, in which case things like export bans are, are patently illegal and bad public health. There's efforts to coordinate travel rules, which are frequently somewhat successful. And they also did things that are pragmatic, such as they didn't try to impose the uh, new medical devices implementation, and they let a whole lot of state aids pass in health and other sectors. In the third phase, fiscal governance, they immediately invoked what the general escape clause. I keep saying this because I just love the concept of a general escape clause, and I would like to have one in many aspects of my life. So they basically stopped applying most of the stringent rules of the semester. They replaced it with EU issued debt to support member states. Now, without conditionality, you have to propose quite a lot of things as a member state that are good things that you're going to do with the money, but it doesn't have the conditionality of, say, troika lending. When we say conditionality, the way to think about it is a bank telling you what to do. It's the IMF. It's not really the basis of the Recovery and Resilience Fund. Next slide, please. So I think the best way to show it is the table of contents on the second and third editions. The second edition was nice and clean. First face, everything to do that was done in the name of health. Second face, everything done in the name of markets. And the third face, everything in the name of fiscal governance. That would have produced an, an extremely awkward and unwieldy book. So look at the change we had to make. We had the first face, which is European Union health policy coming into its own, public health policy in particular, but also some healthcare services policy with a lot based on Article 168. Think of my slide two slides back. But the first face of health elsewhere in consumer protection and social policy is still powerful. It's very difficult to think about ways to manage COVID-19 that don't have a dimension of occupational health and safety, whether it's the position of people in older folks' homes or whether it's workers in frontline businesses, abattoirs, prisons, and so forth. So there's two chapters about the first face. The second face and the third face, where especially in the third face, a lot changed. Ellie will speak about it. And then finally, we realized that the spillover of European Union activities on the world, whether it's vaccines procurement or vaccines donation, whether it's liberalization of trade law or it's the use of civil protection mechanisms outside the EU, which is where many of them were born, we started to see so much EU stuff affecting the world in the area of health, not just foreign aid, but the EU was a major player that makes the weather in so many dimensions of health that we had to give it its own chapter. So I'd say this is a proud story. The COVID-19 experience has been terrible for the esteem of and legitimacy of a lot of governments around the world, and that's not necessarily changing. But the European Union, in a sense, the story is that the member states discovered they were living in a federation, no matter what they call it legally, and they realized they needed a federal government to provide health for them in the midst of a crisis and in preparation for future crises. So after the debt crisis, I spent 10 years saying rude things about the EU. Since the pandemic crisis, I've started being accused of being much too sunny about it. So I hope the discussion clarifies how you might wish to feel about it. Over to you, Matthias, while I fight with my IT. <laughs> Okay, thank, thank you so much, Scott, for this uh, succinct and uh, excellent overview, actually, on not only the book, basically, but uh, basically EU and health, health policy. And also, thank you so much for re-emphasizing how in the, the growth of importance 
of uh, measures under the public health mandate, but also with regards to the economic governance. So these are two areas which are super important now. And as you said, also global health and EU health policy in the world has also grown. And we have tried to, to make this um, actually more explicit. Really good. The only thing which worries me is I'm still waiting for my drinks. So where are they? George, can't you help us with that one, actually? So um, we are still happy. We are very happy to take questions from you and we will try to, to answer them as far as we can. But we would like to jump now right into the third aspect of uh, the third piece of EU health policy, the economic governance, because I think this is an area which has been particularly interesting and where member states have already submitted a lot of plans and are starting to implement. And uh, I think for the for the fiscal outlook, it's extremely important. Also, as uh, Scott reminded us, fiscal governance actually started as some sort of austerity supporting policy. And now it has been changed over the years. And now again, a, a major change has taken place. Ellie, would you mind to fill us a little bit in on this particular aspect of um, the ongoing reforms? Thank you. I definitely will. Thank you, BTS. I'm not enthused by Scott's experience, but I will attempt to share my screen and see if there is any more success. Haha. Does that that showing for everybody else as well, not just me? Perfect. Super, thank you. Okay, thank you, Matthias. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Eleanor Brooks. I'm a lecturer at the Global Health Policy Unit at the University of Edinburgh and a newbie to the Everything book. I'm delighted to be involved in, in this edition. I'm really pleased that they felt compelled to, to pick up the pen again a, a couple of years early so that I could be involved. Um, as Matthias mentioned, I'm going to talk a bit about the third phase of EU health policy in the chapter that, that covers the, the developments there, which have been pretty significant uh, and, and have some impressive potential long-term implications. So Scott introduced the third phase of health policy as being linked to fiscal governance. So it's a set of structures that essentially enables the EU to monitor and survey the budgetary policies of its member states and to attempt to coordinate between the member states any fiscal and economic policy decisions. And the idea there is to ensure some form of stability and to prevent a recurrence of the crisis that we saw um, in, in the late 2000s. What that means is that the processes that are in place follow a cycle. They follow a cycle whereby the, the EU sets um, an agenda, a set of priorities that it would like the member states to focus on when adopting its economic and fiscal policies. There's then a process of reporting and, and devising of plans, which is done bilaterally. Uh, and then the member states submit plans to say that this is, is what their fiscal and economic policy will look like for the coming years. And then the Commission and the council sign off on those plans and say yes okay and here is a set of recommendations about what we'd like you to do and focus on so that was the structure that existed and stood uh, when the pandemic hit and that was mostly organized through something called the european semester as scott mentioned in terms of the fiscal policy response, so the response that the EU made within this, this fiscal policy um, portfolio that it has, we can identify some short term measures and some longer term measures. So in the short term, as Scott mentioned, essentially the first fiscal policy response was to suspend fiscal policy, was to temporarily suspend these very strict debt and deficit rules that, that, that the EU has and enforces upon member states. And this reflected the need to allow governments to spend and to, to accrue debt, deficits and debt to be able to finance the responses to, to COVID-19 within their country. So that was one of the first things that was done in, in March of last year. There were some other short term fiscal responses, those mostly involved utilising unspent funds or outstanding funds and making those available to shore up health systems or finance the purchase of, of medical equipment or personal protective equipment. Um, some funds were made available to support labour market policies for unemployment and to support businesses and these sorts of things. So there was a, a move to sort of gather up any available money in the pots that already existed to make that available to support fiscal policy responses. But the more interesting set of responses at the EU level in, in fiscal terms, I think, are the longer term responses. So Scott mentioned, and that's the first time I'm seeing the cartoon with the elephant with the, the big bags under its arms, that that's, that's the main long term change is, is a, a revision of the multi-annual financial framework, so the EU's long term budget and the adoption of a really sizable recovery package. Um, under the next generation EU agreement. Um, and those are, are fairly unprecedented in, 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 their, in their scale and they all produce new funds and new instruments um, for health. So key within the recovery package is the recovery and resilience facility. So this is the big pot of money that Scott mentioned that is made up essentially of funds that will be available as grants and funds that will be available as low conditionality loans. So money that can be accessed with, with relatively limited 
conditionality. And within those instruments, there are a few important implications for health policy, I think, that I'll, I'll try and introduce here and then would welcome some Q&A on if, if I can explain further um, and see what people feel about the implications of these. So the first thing to say about these pots of money is that they have made resilience of the health system as a first factor and crisis preparedness and response as a second factor, long-term objectives and goals of the major EU policy frameworks. So what this means is that in spending EU funds and in designing national investments and reforms, member states are being encouraged to pursue these goals, to pursue health system resilience and crisis preparedness and response. That puts health higher up the central EU agenda than it's ever been before. So that I think is the, is the, the first major innovation uh, in this sort of field of health policy. The second thing to mention is that within those documents, in practice, what that means is that when member states are submitting the proposals, the plans that they have to submit to say how they're going to spend any of these EU funds, they have to show that they are servicing those objectives. So they have to show which of those reforms and investments will try to support health system resilience, will support crisis preparedness and response. And when the Commission and the Council are assessing those plans, health system resilience and crisis preparedness and response are some of the criteria against which those plans will be measured. And a really important part of that is that what that means is that member states will be encouraged to support those plans and their reporting with data on each of these factors. So whereas before we had quite sparse, as Scott mentioned, data on public health capacities, certainly on, on, on preparedness and response for crisis and on health system resilience, we stand a chance now of gathering a much more comprehensive bank of data in these areas and perhaps being able to map out some of the inequalities and the inconsistencies that we see there. Um, so that's a really important feature of the recovery and resilience facility. The third implication that I wanted to mention um, is that these plans are really closely steered, much more so than they were under the European semester, the framework that existed before. So the Commission has issued templates, it's issued examples of what it considers to be good investments and reforms under the facility, and it's issued extensive guidance, all of which mention health explicitly, which was never a feature before under the semester. And what this means is that member states will have to speak much more closely um, to the reforms that they're making and how they fall in line with and, and contribute to health. Um, it's early days for this and, I, and, and we need to do a little bit more work on it, but it, what seems to be happening so far is that the majority of the plans that have been submitted contain health reforms, which suggests that this process is working in terms of forcing member states to make those reforms more explicit and include them within their plans. The million dollar question, I think, which I'll leave us with perhaps for the Q&A, is whether or not this process and the changes in the process that have been made um, are able to bring about long term structural reform that benefits health in a way that the semester was largely unable to. So there are some reasons that we might be a little bit sceptical about that. First of all, it's not clear how much resilience of the health system and crisis preparedness and response is going to equate to broader health policies. As a health community, we know that health system resilience is about public health on a much broader scale and a much more requires a much more holistic sense of health, but it's not clear how much that's going to be translated uh, within the EU context and the context that we're talking about. So we might be a little bit sceptical from that perspective. One cause for optimism, I think, is that whilst this structure is temporary, which is the main reason that we might, might doubt its ability to make any long-term change, we know that these sorts of instruments are learned and replicated. We know that when we put instruments and processes in place, be that reporting and monitoring or, or recommendation processes that work well, they tend to be replicated and, and, and institutionalised. So though it is technically speaking a, a temporary instrument and a temporary set of processes, there's a good chance that it will outlast its current mandate um, and provide some long term change. Um, I will leave it at that, Matthias, and, and hope that there are some questions to follow up. Ellie, thank you so much. That's a lot of uh, lot of stuff, actually, you know, for just one slide and a lot of things <laughs> are going on. And actually, we were until the summer um, doing a webinar series on Build Back Better, you know, what countries are doing um, after COVID-19 or during COVID-19. And there were already a couple of countries that said we are using the money actually for strengthening our health systems. I remember very well Italy using it for long term care, Austria as well for some pilots. So there's quite a, stuff, uh, quite a lot of stuff uh, actually going on. And actually, it's not the only instrument. There's a whole a large number of instruments coming from the European uh, Union supporting countries um, striving to implement better health systems uh, reform, actually. And uh, as you say, it needs to be seen whether this can all amount to something, but uh, we're still in good, good hope. 
Well, thank you so much, Ali. And um, I mean, you all have seen, you know, how fundamental the changes are. Scott started with it in particular with the public health mandate, but also with the with the um, economic governance. And of course, that poses the question, you know, we have a lot of new instruments and secondary legislation is coming out, you know, but the basis on which we build is still in a way the same. Is it adequate or uh, do we need to change it? Scott showed us the text actually, you know, how um, easy the public health mandate in the treaty can be used to close the door, you know, and to keep it closed. And only if all member states are happy to open it, you know, but this is, of course, not really um, proactive and cannot help policymakers very much. So, Anik, maybe we can uh, put this question to you as a lawyer, uh, very, very well versed uh, in constitutional law as well. Maybe you can give us a couple of insights on the debate and what are the options actually. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I was uh, also a newbie on this book. Uh, and so very happy to be and very happy to be a part of it. Um, um, I That's a good question, Matthias. So um, I think it's important to, well, first of all, um, as Scott also uh, uh, explained there's a lot that can be done without actually having an, uh, an expanded or a more stronger legal basis in the treaty. And if we now look at uh, some of the new laws that have been adopted and that we also talk about in the book uh, or that are in the run us that are currently under discussion actually, there's uh, a couple of very important legislative proposals I think that have been that have been sort of put in a package that the European Commission calls the European Health Union as many of you know and so there's a legislative package that they call the European Health Union and then there's some other things that they also put in and actually nobody knows exactly what is <laughs> the European Health Union um, but it sounds amazing it sounds like a great idea um, so but uh, but what is what is in that package is of course a, a, a proposal to expand some of the authority of the European um, Medicines Agency, uh, the European Center for Disease Control, um, and then there's uh, the proposal that just came out on HERA on a, a health emergency response authority. But what is what I thought was a very important proposal within this legislative package was that on the expansion of the, the regulation on cross-border threats. Because as, um, uh, as Ellie just explained, within this, the, the, the financial instruments, there are some reporting um, uh, uh, instruments built in. But they're not, it's unclear if those will last and they're relatively soft. But in the new regulation that is proposed on cross-border threats, um, a very important aspect in that is that um, is that there's going to be, or at least that's what the commission is proposing, and there's already some some um, some pushback on that. Uh, but there is a blueprint for national response uh, uh, plans that the that the commission will put out, and then uh, actually also the possibility for the EU to audit member states on the implementation of these plans. Um, the Commission under this proposal would also have a broader right to declare a public health emergency for the whole of the EU. Um, and uh, uh, these kinds of uh, uh, powers, and especially also the power to audit member states, I think can prove to be quite far reaching because uh, uh, um, uh, response plans in, in the field of health involve the whole of the healthcare system, really. It's the resilience of the healthcare system. So it's it's um, uh, surge capacities of hospitals. Uh, it's monitoring supplies. It's a whole bunch of things that involves actually uh, everything that the EU has no legal power on. <laughs> it involves a, uh, an area uh, th where there's a lot of redistribution by the states. There's a lot of funding, state funding, that goes into these services, these health services that are now going to be audited, or if these, if if this uh, law goes through, and so 
um, what, what is legally important in, in these plans is exactly what Ellie also outlined, is that, that the policy practice goes before the legal change. So we can't probably expect any legal change right now, maybe in the context of the Conference of Europe, but I don't see that happening. I don't see a larger legal power happening right now. But what I do see is in this kind of secondary legislation, the ability of the European Commission to start auditing and to create that kind of policy on the ground, now that will lay uh, uh, the groundwork for a potential treaty change. Once, once the practice is there, then the law will follow. And yeah. I think, so I think some of these plans are very, very important, uh, also very important legally. Another important change that is now being proposed is uh, the role of the Health Security Committee. That again, uh, that really started as a very informal group of national representatives that now again is strengthened um, uh, uh, and, and that really involves very high um, or in potential very high ministerial um, uh, representation within the EU. And so there, uh, this kind of institutional growth also is yet another thing of building this structure of, of more EU involvement in the field of health. And then at some point, I think the, the um, legal competence will will come after that uh, and it might take a few years because I guess everything in the field of health goes at a glacial especially in the EU at a glacial um, speed but nonetheless I think for health these things are very very significant. Anik, thank you so much that's a great answer actually to a tricky uh, question and if I get get right what you all are saying is um, uh, Ellie told us that uh, there's more pooling of finance actually now and pooling of debt as well. You told us there's more pooling of sovereignty. So, and Scott said in the beginning, there's more federalization actually in the European Union going on. But at the same time, there are also calls for more multilateralism and more global um, uh, outlook. We've been launching like a couple of days ago, the Monty Report and the Monty Report is on one health, but also on global governance and asking for a pandemic treaty and a lot of governance um, uh, provisions. So Scott, how does, go, does it go together? You know, we are integrating a more, a bit more regional, but on the same, the same moment we know there's uh, more need to collaborate on the, on the global uh, scale as, as well. Is it a contradiction or does it go hand in hand? Um, so one of the things we like to talk about in global public health is global public goods, things like a disease-free planet that's not going to cook us and all of our children. And these goods are really, really hard to deliver. And what rich countries like to do in public health is turn them into what we call club goods, which are shared within rich countries and unavailable to the rest of the world. So most of us in the audience here probably have not had to ever think about tuberculosis, whereas it's a gigantic endemic problem in much of the rest of the world. We are unfortunately replicating exactly that kind of international inequality in vaccines response. We already did a lot of it in the initial wave when it was non-pharmaceutical interventions and where poor countries were left essentially with minimal lockdown options because they didn't have the money to pay people to stay home. But now what's going on with vaccines is really dreadful. And I'm amazed at the short-sightedness of governments. I'm not so amazed at their egotism. The question is more, what, did, what happened in Europe that made a happy story amidst this story of selfishness? And I think a lot of it is the simple recognition that EU is way too integrated to avoid having something like a federal government. So instead of viewing the EU as equivalent to NAFTA or the Association of Southeast Asian Nations or the African Union or something, where some countries come together and maybe they do a joint project, it's better to compare it to the federations. And one of the patterns we saw is that in all the federations where the federal government was not there, you had much bigger problems. So that's the story of India or Brazil or the United States. In the case of the EU, nobody had ever intended to have a federal government. 
they built a federation without a federal health government and without a federal fiscal government. This made it a really strange federation. And I think that's the big change is that in the EU had this combination of a very high level of economic, social, and political integration with no shared health function. And it's a lot more fun, I think, to be optimistically building your new public health function than it is to be in the situation of Brazil or India or the United States where your federal government was supposed to have been helpful and then wasn't. But internationally, it's a story of selfishness. Thanks a lot, Scott. You, again, you are referring to very fundamental changes, actually, in the way uh, Europe is integrating, and we are just witnessing that. At the same time, and I see here a question coming from a colleague in the audience, at the same time, the question is, will they last long, you know, or after, you know, ebbing away of the pandemic, will countries go back to normal and feel, oh, no, we don't need to uh, federalize that much. Maybe we just keep our sovereignty. And it was not such a great idea to have this recovery facility. Let's go back to normal. And luckily, we haven't changed the treaty. You know, the health is still a minor issue. Is there is there a danger that we go back to um, as it was before, you know, that there was no federalization, no pooling of author of of um, um, fund or little pooling of funds and um, sovereignty for for health. I ask all the three of you. Maybe Scott, you want to start, and then Ellie and Anik. So, asking political scientists to predict gives us a, a, a skin condition and a bad case of nerves. I would point back that. The Barroso, nobody thought the Barroso Commission was serious about any dimension of public health. And yet a bunch of stuff happened. Nobody thought the Juncker Commission wanted any role in public health whatsoever. And yet after a reasonable amount of effort, they rolled back a surprisingly small portion of the public health agenda. So back when it was a very politically marginal, low salience issue where there wasn't a lot of evidence that the EU could be an effective actor, it was still hard to get rid of. So in general, in public health, you expect that after the crisis is over, we go backwards. But we're going to be going backward from a much, much higher level. And the European Union as a political institution is not that good at going backward from any given level of integration, sort of. There's very few areas where you've seen an EU competency get established that really significantly erodes. The place I would look is in particular in rescue. It's no accident that a lot of the personal protective equipment that have been stockpiled around the world expired in 2019 because everybody bought in 2009 for the influenza pandemic and then failed to renew the stockpile. So that's where I would look, not on the headline of European Union policies being drawn back, but on the level of member states not co-financing a stockpile of this or that sort of less serious implementation, but still structures which can be reactivated pretty quickly. So much more pragmatic than, let's say, conceptually, ideologically driven, actually. Ellie, please join in. There's actually coming another question through the, uh, through the question and answer feed, and um, that is very much linked to it. And maybe um, Ellie and Anik, you want to pick it up as well. It's about uh, the member states. Of course, this pooling of sovereignty of money and this sort of federalization, even if it is sta stays, as Scott has said, may it produce some sort of backlash in some countries and some member states and also a change in uh, public opinion? You know, it's also that some stakeholders, which are not very present at the um, European level, may not quite like it or feel excluded from this uh, growth in power and authority of the European Union. Ellie, and maybe you start. Yeah, thank you. I think so. Um, yeah, in response to this question about whether member states are more open in the backlash that you mentioned, Matthias, I think that is linked to the to George's question before about how important particular commission presidencies yep. are to the state of health policy, right? Because I think when we talk about Juncker's approach and the Juncker Commission's approach to health, that is very much tied to a perceived backlash around too much Europe in things, right? And that was that was the goal of that agenda. But I think this question actually, Anique, is likely to have 
a much better response to than me because I know she's done a lot of work on, on sort of national positions on, on the EU role in health more recently than I have. My just to pick up on Scott's response, I have a similar political science response, I'm afraid, to George's question, which which is essentially to say, yes, the commission president. But the, the question then becomes about whether we think the individual and the individual's position is more important than the structures that underpin that individual. And I think the answer there is the actual individual commissioner, as Scott has outlined, makes less difference than the processes and, and the policies and the structures that underpin what they do. And so here, when we start to look at, at things like the better regulation agenda, for example, when we start to look at the huge pots of money that are now available to fund cooperation in very pragmatic technical areas that will continue and has always continued, regardless of what the overlying political agenda might be, that is the reason, as Scott says, that the likelihood of all of this being rolled back with some new incoming commission presidency is relatively slim just to get really political science nerdy about it, but I'll hand over to Anik for a more refined citizen's perspective on, on yeah. Anik, please. Yeah, I think that, uh, well, we did some research on on, on, uh, on public support for, for, for more EU solidarity, particularly when it comes to um, medicines and, and the purchasing medicines, so the joint procurement, which is, which can be tricky because it, you know, it can be an area of redistribution, solidarity, etc. And Euro Europeans, well, at least in five different European countries, are pretty much in favor of this. So when we see this anti-health response in the EU, it's often, in my well, at least what we saw in in previous cases, it's often the 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 national health ministries. And I think, and that's understandable because they don't have much power in the EU um, because they don't have a, a, a legal base to create health laws. So they see their counterparts in other, uh, in, in other ministries take up a lot of the stuff that at national level they would be doing. Um, so when the EU is then doing something, it's like, hold on, what's going on here? Why is there some law being created by my colleagues in the finance department? And so, um, so that there's a lot of this kind of constitutional, institutional makeup that makes it hard sometimes. Um, but then again, as, as Scott also points out in, an, in, a, in an, an older article, but very important, I think, is that anyway, health ministries are, are kind of the weakest link in gover government. They're not the strongest ministries. And so you'll see the same in the EU. I mean, that just gets repeated as well. Um, and But, uh, so what uh, George is asking is is um, how likely will it be that some of these new institutional setups, these new structures will, it's super sticky in the EU. Any kind of institutional change is incredibly sticky. So I think these things change. They, they, they'll just get built on and built on. Um, I once talked to a uh, civil servant in, um, in the area of health and he said, you know, EU health policy is like a, uh, like a, like grass. You don't, you don't see it grow, but you have to mow it all, every other day. I don't know how often you have to mow grass, but it just keeps on coming. And and that's um, that's because I think there is, are some functional uh, reasons to to uh, work together. Uh, there's some efficiency reasons to work together. But I also think we should be critical of it. There seems to be this idea that everything that we do in the EU in the area of health is great and that we need all this power for the EU in the field of health. And I think we should be a bit more, uh, we have also seen some instances and, and um, Ali has talked about that, but also Rita Batten, of course, has, has written some important stuff on this, that sometimes it's really not so great what the EU, the, the role of the EU in health. And it really very much depends on the member states and how they're being impacted. I mean, that's a great, that's a great bridge to the next topic, actually, you know, and um, we are largely talking about uh, member states, governments, countries and so on. But in reality, we all know that in in health system, both in the delivery, but also the reform, stakeholders play a huge role, you know, whether these are health authorities, sickness funds, other arms length bodies, uh, self-government, uh, professional organizations. And as I mentioned earlier, very often they feel a little bit excluded actually from, from all this. So my question here is to the three of you, what's in 
what's in it for them? And please bear in mind, this is the EBA conference where we have the European health managers and uh, they probably ask themselves, that's all very interesting. And I like European solidarity. What, what's in for me? What's in for my, my organization, for my hospital, for my health authorities? Scott, would you like to uh, give it a try? Here's the thing. The, the barrier, the really, really two difficult European problems. One is obviously democratic backsliding. The other is simply the disparity between the income and the wealth of different member states. So the barrier to a really big European health care services policy is simply that nobody has come up with the argument that's going to persuade Dutch and German voters to redistribute enough money to Bulgaria or Romania to make the healthcare care systems equivalent. So all the policies, and part of the reason I'm optimistic about their longevity, is these are all policies which don't directly address that, which still leave inferior quality and inferior technology and access in place in the poorer countries. Because as federations go, the European Union has the biggest territorial disparities, essentially, of any of them. So if you thought Italy had a north-south disparity, check out Europe. What that means for healthcare services is you're going to see a lot of activity in public health, a lot of activity in the shared concerns of highly integrated economies. You're going to continue to see a lot of activity, not just in the internal market, but also in things related to the internal market, like, for example, workplace health and safety under social policy. But what we're not going to see, and you'll see limited mutualization of debt, the RRF that Ellie can speak about, I don't think you're going to see the kind of redistribution down into other healthcare systems that it would really take to make the EU a player in healthcare delivery. Just until somebody can persuade German voters that that's a good use of their time and money. Okay, thank you so much. I think the point is very clear, but still, I think there are so many changes, you know, and all these programs which are aiming for at modernizing aspects of healthcare, digitalization, and all this stuff, you know, maybe there is something very concrete in it. Ellie. Yeah, I don't I don't have much to add to that. I'm I'm slightly more optimistic about the capacity for the RRF to be used to address some of these issues. Um, and I think that's simply because it happens without people noticing. There is a huge pot of money and it's possible for it to be earmarked for health related things and it's possible for it to be used in all of the ways that, that Scott describes that would be necessary in order to address some of the inequalities that we know about. Whether it will be is, is quite an open question but I think the potential is there and if we know one thing from the history of EU health policy it's that, that there is enormous capacity to use things not quite as they are meant to be used uh, and so I remain slightly optimistic about that as a yeah as a possibility. Yeah, I agree. I think there's more money in the EU now. So as a health manager, even, you know, or, or as a head of an organization, I would either work with others to try and, and see and help the commission spend that money because I think they're having some trouble coming up with ideas. And uh, as a public health authority or someone in the field, working in the field, I would look at that pot of money and, and, and think, think of some good ideas and, and work with others to see if you can put those ideas uh, into practice. Yeah, I wish some of the money would come our way, but uh, I'm afraid not. Scott, it's time to wrap up. We still have uh, three minutes and unfortunately still no drinks in our hands. You know, what conference is this, George? Come on, Scott, please, you start. I think by far the most important question is the one Josephine Wilson asked, which is when can she download the book? So because a lot of these things are still up in the air, we've delayed the actual publication a little bit. It's going to be dated 2022, and we're probably going to actually have the launch. This was a teaser, and perhaps we'll have a real launch with real drinks instead of a bottle of tap water in January or February of 2022. So that's when the book will be available, and we hope that by then we'll have a very good sense to maximize its usefulness of what things like HERA and the health cross-border health threats regulation are going to look like. Otherwise, I hope this was already useful. I hope it inspires you to tell all your friends to download the book when it comes out. And I really want to thank our speakers and also our audience for coming in this late evening reception where I hope you furnished yourself with something good to drink. Thank you so much, Scott. And I think that the forthcoming third edition will not be the last one. And I'm so happy to see uh, some new faces, you know, um, as uh, in the team of, of authors. So they will 
they will continue even if others are dropping out for varieties of, of reasons. So thank you so much. Thank you for the session. Thank you for staying with us in the late afternoon. I hope this was, as Scott says, uh, an appealing teaser for you. And uh, I, I, I guarantee it's an easy read, actually. It's a nice read. It's not full of jargon. On the very contrary, you know, it's, uh, it's made for people that want to know but are not necessarily the super expert in the fields. And it costs us a bit of an effort, but I think it's worth it. So thank you so much and hope to see you soon. And bye-bye. Uh, Thanks, Matthias. Pleasure.